Hi, and welcome to Basic Folk. This is a podcast where we have honest conversations with folk musicians. Thanks for finding us. I'm your host, Cindy Howes. Wow. Nice to be with you. Alex Sturbaum is a traditional folk musician originally from Cincinnati, Ohio, which offers a thriving community of folk players and contra dancers. There was tons of music in the house growing up thanks to their father, Arthur, who played and hosted jams. The young Alex fell in love with traditional music of all types, the jigs and reels of Ireland, the ballads of Appalachia, sea shanties, and more, and began playing the Irish frame drum, the boron. Starting off as a rhythm player still influences Alex's playing, even though they have moved on to many other instruments, like the guitar, button accordion, bazooki, banjo, mandolin, and singing. They attended Oberlin College to study biology and geology, and that's where Alex became enchanted with performing at contra dances. Alex recently came out as a non-binary person and uses the they-them pronouns. Alex has found the Contra community to be a welcoming place, which is evident in the gender-neutral dances that have been held in coastal cities. Alex also talks about writing traditional songs that fill vacancies in narratives they wished already existed. For example, on the new album Loomings, the song Sweet Mary Starbuck is about the culture of whalers, wives, and Nantucket. The husbands would go off to sea for years, and Alex wrote from the perspective of two whalers' wives who fell in love. This conversation covers everything from environmental restoration to how gender-neutral contra dances lead to better communication when it comes to consent. Enjoy this wonderful person. Thanks to Alex for appearing on the podcast. We're going to take a listen to Sweet Mary Starbuck from the new album Loomings. And then we'll get to our conversation with Alex Sturbaum on Basic Folk. I married John Coffin just two years ago. He's a fine man, as all Nantucket knows. And he's bound to make second mate, or so I hear. If the Charles brings home enough oil next year. At twenty, a mother. At nineteen, a bride. With a child on my knee. And another inside My heart, it was broken and swept out to sea Where my sweet Mary found it and brought it to me Sweet Mary Starbuck from Nantucket Town If she was the sea, I would willingly drown And her voice like a bell on a clear wind Thursday sets my heart a ringing and winging away. All right, Alex, thanks so much for talking to me today. Pleasure to be here. You grew up in Cincinnati. Um, what was your neighborhood like, and how do you think your town helped shape who you are? Well, Cincinnati actually has a uh, really wonderful and strong traditional traditional Irish music scene. And when I started to get into folk music, I, I grew up in a musical family, or at least my dad played a lot of music, but it was always just something that was around the kitchen table. And so when I turned maybe 12 and got really interested in, in folk music and Celtic folk music specifically, there was already a really cohesive community that was dedicated to to playing traditional music, and I was really lucky to have a lot of mentors there. People like Susan Cross, Cindy and Steve Mady, just some really wonderful musicians and teachers. Uh, you're talking about your dad playing, and there was plenty of music growing up in your house. Your dad is Arthur. Um, That's correct. Played old time and bluegrass fiddle and probably other instruments as well. And wondering if you could talk about that a little bit, like what his musical presence was like when you were a kid. Dad is an amazing musician. He 
Fiddle was his first instrument, but he also plays mandolin and banjo and guitar and and all sorts of things. And there was sort of just always music in the house growing up. And I, I admit that when I was small, I didn't really appreciate it. It was just something that was happening around the table. And I, I do have memories of like going up to dad when he was sitting in a chair playing a guitar and just slapping my hand across the strings because I wanted him to pay attention to me. Yeah, enough, dad. And, you know, <laughs> yeah, and you know, now that uh, now that I've been playing guitar for, you know, 15 years, I'm just like, oof, sorry, dad. <laughs> but no, dad was, um, he never, like, he never, you know, sat me down and said, you're going to play music. He always, he sort of let me find my own way. And when I got really into folk music when I was 12 or 13, uh, he, (laughs) for one thing, he, you know, I had access to all of these instruments in the house. Um, he, He likes to joke that you had access to guitars, banjos, fiddles, mandolins. So of course you decided I want to play the button accordion. (laughs) Um, But no, um, he gave me access to instruments and to, you know, lots of really great recorded music and also to his friends who all, who also proved to be really good mentors. And also he's, he's always been a very clear eyed individual, my father. And when I, when he saw that I was serious about music, he sat me down and gave me a very frank talking to. He said, Alex, to date you have exhibited no musical talent whatsoever. He says, that does not mean that you can't be a good musician, but it means that you're going to have to work really hard to do it. I think that that was some of the most valuable musical advice I ever got because I, I started on the Bauran, the Irish frame drum, and from that I sort of fought my way kicking and screaming into getting a sense of rhythm and then uh, moved on to other stuff. But it was just so important, I think, to uh, to be told from the first moment that like talents well and good but if you want to if you want to do this successfully if you want to be a good musician it's going to take a lot of work. Hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about what his jams were like in your house? And the oh, community absolutely. the community that he surrounded himself with. He has a core of of very very deep close friends um who he's known since his college days when they were in a bluegrass band called free beer because <laughs> that's what it costs to hire them and and just they were always around just a couple times a year and they would hang out around you know in the living room or in the kitchen and they would sing songs and they would harmonize and they would play bluegrass and some of them were getting into irish so they would bring those tunes in there were never any real rules as to what you could and couldn't play. And I think that that has really influenced me as a musician. The fact that rather than saying, you know, you're a bluegrasser, you have to play bluegrass. You're an Irish player, you have to play Irish. That you can bring in all of these influences and weave them together. And also just, they liked each other and they were playing music not not as, you know, a cultural preservation thing or as something that we take very, very seriously in this house. It was something that they did because it was really fun. And I think that that sort of joy and love for playing music is something that has always stuck with me. Yeah, it's like, it's not for preservation and it also doesn't sound like they were doing it for commercialization and to to make money from it per se, but it's an interesting place for you to grow up in. In that, in that space of just making music because it feels good. Absolutely. A theme that comes up for you um, is your complicated feelings about gatekeeping in folk music. First, firstly, for those who might not know what that means, can you explain the concept? Um, absolutely. There, there are a couple different... Uh, genres of folk music where sometimes people will present a sort of barrier to entry like you will have to have a certain level of level of musical chops before you can enter or a certain amount of familiarity with the tradition um and like it's i think it's a very common issue in traditional irish music which was the style 
that I started out playing. And like I, I do have very complicated feelings about it because I do love the tradition, and I think that for the tradition to continue, um, you know, people have to have to understand it and and respect it, um, and that requires some some study and that requires some delving. However, and this is a big however, I think that you need to make it incredibly open and welcoming to people who might be interested. There are a few things that are as as depressing as some bright-eyed young player who's, you know, learned their first couple tunes coming into a session with great enthusiasm and basically someone stops the session and tells them what they're doing wrong. Like, people have to find their own ways. People have to make their, make their own experiences and in some ways come to love this tradition on their own terms. Otherwise, it's going to fizzle and die. If you, if you keep pushing, in other words, if you keep pushing people away because they don't love it in exactly the same way that you do, or because they approach it in a different way than you do, then you're eventually going to end up with a very small insular community that only talks to each other and growls at everyone else. And I don't think that that's any way for a community to thrive. I really believe strongly that if you try to keep everything, if you try to preserve the tradition behind glass, if you try to make it something that is a historical document preserved beautifully in time, it's going to suffocate and it's going to die because that's not why people have been doing it over the millennia that it has been developing. Mm -hmm. I feel like there are always going to be people who are interested in playing it just the way it's been played before. You have to remember that like while, you know, there are a million beautiful old gems that are worth preserving, people are coming up with new gems in the tradition every day. And I think you have to let them. Your first instrument you mentioned was the Baran? The Baran, yeah. The Baran, um, which is a frame drum of Irish origin. What made you pick that instrument, and how does having a rhythm instrument as your foundation impact your relationship to the beat? Thank you for this question. I'm really excited about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, despite the fact that there was music in the house growing up, the the thing that kickstarted me wanting to play, like for for music to be a thing that I wanted to play, was my discovery of the. Uh, of the Newfoundland folk rock band Great Big C when I was at a formative age. And the amount of power that that band is, was able to bring without, without a you know, drum kit drummer for the first decade of their existence, with all of the power in the band coming from the bass, the guitar, and the bauron. I had never heard the bauron before, or at least never listened to it, and just like, it sounds like a human heartbeat. It's so powerful. It's so driving. Um, the tone is dynamic, so you can change it. You can make it higher or lower and shift it. It's almost like, you know, an African talking drum in that way. And so I just immediately fell in love with that sound. And I'm so glad that the Bauron was my first instrument as well, because as you said, like, Starting on a rhythm instrument gives you a completely different approach to how you to how you approach the rest of the music. Like I always build from the from the beat up, because my first instrument was Bauron. My second instrument that I got serious about was uh, guitar accompaniment, rhythm guitar. And now I play you know button accordion and mandolin family instruments, but I always approach it from a beat first perspective. When you're playing music that has derivations, or that even when it's in a concert setting, it's dance music first and foremost, I think that that is really, really helpful. So like even when I'm playing a melody, if I think about a variation or, a, or some sort of ornament, I'm thinking about how it's going to set up the downbeat and make, and make the groove of the, of the tune or the song hit harder. Hmm. You're a full-time musician now, but That's correct. Was it quite recently you were working on environmental restoration? Yeah, that's correct. I moved to um 
to Washington from Ohio in 2014. In 2015, I got a job with the Washington Conservation Corps, uh, doing mostly um, native planting and invasive, invasive plant removal throughout public and private lands throughout Washington. So would you be like pulling up rooted plants and planting like Johnny Appleseed of invasive plants? Exactly. Um, we were fighting knotweed and blackberry and scotch broom and planting, you know, stuff like Sitka spruce and salmonberry and trying to trying to reduce monocultures and make make some healthier habitats. Mm. And it was tremendously rewarding work and really, really a joyous thing to be part of. And also also it provided some good songwriting material. There's a song on my first album, River Run Wide, called Pulling Broom, which was basically came out of I I've always loved, you know, maritime music and sung hundreds of sea shanties about doing hard work on board a sailing vessel. And I was just thinking, you know, I'm doing hard work right now. Why don't I have a song? (laughs) I love that. Where did your interest in environmentalism come from? And did you ever find your music and your science world colliding? I guess with the songwriting, but anything else? (laughs) I've had access to science from an early age. Um, my mother is is not is not a musician, but she is a uh, she is a PhD researcher um, in neuroscience. So I guess I had all the science coming from one parent and all mm. the music coming from the other. And so I've had a lot of really wonderful chances to uh, do musical stuff. I've or not do musical stuff, do science stuff. I um, I actually, when I went to college at Oberlin, I was studying biology and geology, and that's what my degree's in. I've always just loved and been fascinated by the natural world. I just the the myriad ways that it interconnects, the the delicate balances, and just the wild things that have been able to evolve over the millennia. It's a it's a really fascinating world out there, and I care really strongly about preserving it and keeping it as healthy as we can. Yeah, at Oberlin, which has produced a bunch of well-known musicians like Josh Ritter, Liz Fair, Rhiannon Giddens, why were you focused on science and not music? For one thing, I didn't really think that I would... I knew I'd be playing music for the rest of my life, but I didn't expect myself to go professional. It was something that sort of snuck up on me. Um, And also, I actually ended up, while I didn't study music at Oberlin on an academic level, it was at Oberlin that I formed my first contradance band, Gallimaufry. Um, And the fact is that, you know, I'd, I'd played Irish music for a while, but when I got to Oberlin, I started playing for contradances because that's where the tunes were and I wanted to play fiddle tunes. And then... The, uh, the fiddler from uh, Gallimaufry, who is my best friend and uh, erstwhile musical collaborator Brian Lindsay, ended up also coming out to Washington when I did. And so we formed a duo called Countercurrent, and we've been touring pretty extensively ever since. As the years went by in Washington, you know, I was working, working hard labor during the day and then spending evenings and weekends gigging as hard as I could. And I eventually went you know, I could, I could probably make a go of this. I've, I'm gigging enough and I've built up enough contacts that I think I can make this happen. And so I did. And (laughs) I had about five good months, but then COVID hit. Oh man. Gosh. Um, to go back to the contra dances that you started playing at, at Oberlin, can you explain what contra dances involve and a little bit more about what the culture is like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, contra dancing is a um, it's a style of folk dancing that uh, is practiced in a lot of places, but has its deepest roots, as far as I know, in New England. And it's it's got elements of English country dance and in- elements of um, of Irish Cayley dancing and elements of square dancing. A lot of the moves are familiar from square dancing, like, you know, swing your partner, a la man left, etc. But the big difference is that you are 
it's a sort of 30 second dance pattern and it's you and your partner are dancing in a long line down the room and the pattern of the dance is maybe a 30 second long sequence of steps and at some point you progress so you dance with this one couple for 30 seconds and then you move on and you dance with another couple and so it's a it's a wonderfully social dance it's really energetic there's the music is generally really really lively and the dance can go on for anywhere from 8 to 12 minutes long so there's a lot of room for for dynamic energy to to rise and fall within that dance and also as as you might expect from such a uh, from such a social dance the the people who who practice this who are into it are just generally a really warm and welcoming and loving community. And they also tend to be very passionate about folk arts, um, but of various kinds. Because there's contra dancers who, who are really strong shanty singers and social singers. There's ones who are Morris dancers as well. There's ones who do English country dance. There's contra dancers who are old time musicians. There's contra dancers who are Irish musicians. Um, there are contra dancers who do crankies and woodcuts and all kinds of amazing things. And well, crank first before you move on, crankies I know from Anna and Elizabeth. Can you just explain those really quickly? A cranky is a um, it's a sort of form of folk art where there's basically a huge scroll that has a sort of a visual storyline written on it. And it's got two cranks, and the sc- or the scroll is put into a box, and the box has two cranks. And so, usually to musical accompaniment, you you turn the cranks, and the scroll just sort of scrolls to the side. It's uh, it almost feels like what a a way to sort of animate a story before video was a thing. Yeah, the original music video. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> In hearing about the Contra community, I have found a quote from you saying that the community is one of the most welcoming, loving, and inclusive communities I've ever been a part of. Um, As a member of the LGBTQ community and a non-binary person, how helpful was that welcoming community in accepting yourself and growing into your identity? That's actually a hard question because um, when I... When I discovered contra dancing, I still identified as straight and cis. Like this is, like my my coming out and um, and realizing this about myself has been a, uh, a comparatively recent thing. That being said, there are so many amazing amazing queer and non-binary contra dancers and people within the community that a big I think that honestly, a big part of it was when my band Countercurrent played queer contra dance camp in uh, in the Bay Area, and just like being in that huge community, I think I felt loved, I felt safe, and I felt accepted. And I think that knowing that there was such a such a great community ready to ready to accept whoever I ended up being made it a lot easier for me to become whoever I ended up being. Mm. So that was quite recent that you came out. Last October, I believe. Wow. Was when I was when I made it official. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I have a couple questions about first of all, Queer Country did a really great article on you in a great interview. And you were talking with them about gender neutral contra dancing. If you could talk about the differences between a gender gender neutral dance and a non gender neutral dance. Honestly, like mechanically, there's very, very little difference. The only difference really is that the caller is instead of saying, you know, gents and ladies for the terms of who's dancing on the left, who's dancing on the right, they're saying they they'll use you know, ones and twos, or they'll use larks and ravens, or larks and robins, or they'll use leads and follows, although that's um, hotly debated. Hmm. And I think that there have been lots of debates on on it, but I think a lot of them just boil down to, well, what are we going to call the roles then? But the thing about 
uh, gender-neutral contradances that, for one thing, I really love it. Partly because it makes it a lot easier for people to dance whatever roles they want to. Because, um, you know, some people just like dancing on the left and some people like dancing on the right. And whatever you say, like, a lot, I know a lot of people um, who have said that gents and ladies are just archaic terms. So it's already clearly defined that anyone can dance any role. And on paper, that's true. But the fact is, in some subtle way, that's going to influence it with the result that if you look, you know, conventionally feminine and you show up wanting to dance the gents role, there's a fairly significant chance that somebody is going to just like see you coming and assume that you're in the wrong position and either at best get confused and at worst bodily try to move you to whatever place Mm. they want you to be in. And that's no good. So I think that that's really, really healthy that it sort of normalizes that. But I also think it goes deeper than that. I think that Uh, The contradancing community, as have a lot of communities, and this is a very, very good thing, have been talking a lot about about consent and how it applies to... I mean, and that's an important thing to think about in a a social setting where, you know, everybody is touching each other. Um, I think that one thing that gender-neutral contra does to normalize consent in a very explicit way is that you start every dance asking, you know, would you like to, you know, which role would you prefer to do? You make no assumptions. I think starting every dance with that one question, what's your preference, I think that opens the door to a lot of other healthy and consent-oriented behaviors on the contradance floor. Like, for example, making it okay to say no if someone asks you to dance and you don't want to dance with them. Or saying, no, I would prefer that you not dip me or not twirl me a whole bunch, which, you know, it is absolutely people's right to mm. to refuse that. And I think that it does a good job of getting people acclimatized in small ways to important and healthy behaviors. And that's not even touching the, uh, the obvious benefit of, you know, people who are, who are non-binary and don't feel comfortable with either label of, you know, gent or lady, can feel a lot more comfortable and welcomed there. I really love the idea of, um, and I don't exactly have a question here, but I really love the idea of gender neutral contra dance, helping people with like figuring out consent and not making assumptions. And also the idea with like general communication where, um, if you want to know something about someone, you just ask them instead of like making an assumption about their exactly. gender or, you know, what, you know, what they would like for lunch or, you know, just even <laughs> even stuff like that. Like, I love that idea as like a general practice of, you know, maybe we should have a national gender neutral contra dance every month. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. I, I wouldn't mind that, but... Uh... We'll wait until until it is safe to do totally, so. Totally, yeah, of course. You're really good at working modern issues into traditional form. You say, I like to try and fill vacancies in the tradition and sing the songs I wish already existed in it. When did you start to think doing that, and what does it mean to you to create songs where you hear... LGBTQ issues in the music that you love the most? I think that the wonderful thing about folk music is that it doesn't belong to anyone because it belongs to everyone. And so when I, when I write a song that, you know, explores a perspective that's not often heard in folk music, I just want to get it out there because it's something that, it's a subject that's important to me in a style of music that means a whole lot to me. I also just think that a lot of the time folk songs are the stories that weren't allowed to be told or that people didn't think were important to, enough to write down. One of my favorite quotes comes from Irish singer Frank Hart who said, those in power write the histories, those who suffer write the songs. And so, I, I mean, and obviously I'm not saying that like being queer is suffering, but I do think that it's kind of sad that 
a lot of those stories weren't allowed to be told. And so when I, you know, sing a song like, you know, Sweet Mary Starbuck, for instance, I'm not singing that to drop a big political message, except in as much as the fact that, you know, queer people exist and can be happy is a political message, which it's kind of sad that it has to be. Yeah. But it's a it's a true story that never that never got to be told. Mm. So I just wanted to tell it. Your latest solo album is Loomings. It just came out this year. Um, it's your second solo record. You started this, and, and correct me if I get any of this history wrong, you started this at the uh, beginning of the pandemic, which I don't know about you, but like when it first started, it was like pretty scary times. Um, mm-hmm. What were you feeling going into the studio and how did your feelings evolve as you got into the project? And how do you think that translates on the album? Well, Brian and I um, had actually just just landed in New York for the start of uh a three and a half week tour, the lo- the longest tour that we were ever we'd ever done before. When the pandemic hit, and we had to cancel the tour and and go home, and so I think that when when I started it, I was you know very scared and confused and sort of the and the entire miasma of emotions that that I think everyone was feeling back in March. But I I knew I had to go into the studio partly because. I just knew that I had to keep that momentum up somehow because I needed something to focus on. Otherwise, I would just be sort of sitting with nothing to do but think about the, the state of the world. But Loomings, I think, really captures a lot of, of what I was feeling during the, uh, over the last few years and especially over the last you know four or five months because it's, it's a lot darker in content than than my previous album, at least in tone. I, the River Run Wide actually has a higher body count when you, when you count how many, <laughs> how many people actually die in, in the songs. But, but Loomings has a, has a much more ominous tone, which sort of comes from the, the near constant feeling of dread that, that we have all been living under for a while. Um, but at the same time, there is an there is an element of of hope to it, and and almost of defiance, because the thing is I'm I am sort of very very scared and concerned a lot, but I have also seen just great great depths of human kindness and human support throughout this pandemic, and I do in my heart of hearts think that we'll be able to get through it and make something better out of it on the other side. Mm. And so I, I tried really hard to, uh, to do that with Loomings, to like keep it, keep it dark and ominous because that's where, where I was at. But I also wanted to, to have those hopeful notes and, and almost moments of sort of anthemic defiance that I do not care how how many people want to spout hatred and despair because I think that we can get through this. Hmm. It's interesting to hear that you just came out in October and this is your second solo record. Um, and it seems like it's your first that you've made since you've came out. Um, how do you think the, that process has changed your playing or changed your outlook on music? I think that in some ways it hasn't changed it at all because I like I don't really view myself as a queer folk musician. I, I view myself as a folk musician who happens to be queer. Um, but I did want to put, you know, for one thing, I had I had written Sweet Mary Starbuck, and I I really wanted to put this song on the album just because it's a it's a song that I'm that I'm proud of and I I wanted to share. Um, and also the the song by the door on the album is a song where i where i just very intentionally do not mention the gender of the narrator or their partner and i would say that if if sort of coming out has changed my music in any way it's that i i think i think harder about 
when I'm writing a song about about whether I'm doing a good job of representing viewpoints, especially viewpoints that aren't mine. And, you know, is this song going to be a force for good in the world? Or is it just, you know, if I'm, if I'm doing this, if I'm putting something out into the world, is it worthwhile? Is it making a positive change? And I don't know exactly how that last point relates, except in as much as I, I did a lot of sort of inward searching towards coming out, and I think that that sort of critical process applies to, mm. applies to music. But yeah, I, I do not think that I do not think that my pronouns affect the way I play the accordion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Sweet Mary Starbuck. What a great song. Um, I'd love for you to tell the story of that song instead of me just trying to sum it up in two lines because it's such a cool concept. Thanks very much. Um, Sweet Mary Starbuck is just, it's, it's a song about the wives of two uh, 19th century Nantucket whalemen falling in love. And it was, it was sort of inspired by, uh, I was reading Nathaniel Philbrick's In the Heart of the Sea, which is a, a very good book on the, the tragedy of the whale ship Essex. And it started with a chapter on the, the culture of Nantucket in the 19th century. And it mentioned that the women of Nantucket had a um, very unusual amount of freedom and control over their lives for 19th century America, largely because the entire male population of the island would go to sea for three years at a time. And I remember the author saying something offhanded about how since the men were away so, for so long, the, uh, the women had to live without you know, romantic companionship for long periods of time. And I just remember thinking, I don't think the concept of queer women occurred to you. <laughs> um, and so I, I thought, you know, so they must have fallen in love at some point. Like, this must have happened. And before I knew it, the, the song had, had appeared. And in writing the song, I, I really did my best to, um, to make it feel historically accurate. I, I often try and throw sort of historical details or phrasings in when I'm, writing, when I'm writing a folk song, and I really wanted it to be grounded in the time and place. I, I feel like people are making great forays into, into writing sort of queer, queer songs in, in modern times for social singing, but I feel like these are songs that people would have sung if they could have in you know, the 1900s and queer people, or the 1800s, and queer people have always, always existed. And so uh, I wrote the song just to, uh, to sort of speak to that and to, and to tell that, that little story, provide a, provide a little vignette of just someone who was in a time and place and was just completely dazzled, starry-eyed in love. I love that. I love the story. I can't wait for the movie. Can't wait for the Broadway production. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if if they came calling, I would I would at least hear them out. <laughs> no, I'd be excited. You started talking about it a little bit, but can you talk more about why it's important to write historical queer stories? Yeah, um, I think simply put, because queer folks have always existed, and I think that because we are lucky enough to live in a period of time when queerness is beginning to be accepted and indeed celebrated at times. Um, I think that it's worth remembering that this isn't like a fad. This isn't something that is newly fangled. It's something that has always been part of the human experience, and we finally have the, uh, the liberty to, to discuss it and to talk about it and to hopefully make it just a thing that exists, an everyday part of life that nobody feels the need to comment on or moralize about. Mm. And so I think that writing, writing queer songs in the folk tradition is important for that reason, because folk songs, even, even new folk songs, they sound old, and this tradition is really, really old. And I think queer people have as much of a right to the folk tradition as anyone else does. Like I said, music that belongs to no one because it belongs to everyone. And, you know, there's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of things in, in the folk woodpile that are, 
obviously very patriarchal, very heteronormative, often very misogynistic. There's lots of conversations, really good conversations that have been had about how do you change that? Do you preserve it because for authenticity or do you change it so that you're not supporting those ideas or do you offer disclaimers or what do you do? And I think that that's really important stuff to do. But I think that also in addition to like excising problematic elements, I think it's just as healthy to uh, put in healthy things. Hmm. Oh. Um, how did you come up with the name Mary Starbuck? Um, that is one of two references to Moby Dick in the album, the other being the title of the album, Loomings, which is the first chapter of Moby Dick. Um, I was just thinking of, I, again, I wanted to set it in, in a time and place. And, for example, the first line of the song, I married John Coffin just two years ago. Common was a, Coffin, rather, was a very common surname on Nantucket, especially at that time. And um, Starbuck is the name of the first mate in Moby Dick, who is honestly the saddest character in the whole in the whole book. He just wants to do right by his crew and make sure that everyone gets paid at the end of the voyage, and he's stuck being subservient to a crazed fanatical person, which I am sure a lot of people can identify with these days. Mm. I just wanted a name that felt of a time and of a place. It's a great, great name. Okay, that's the end of the serious interview. We're going to do something now called the lightning round. Fire away. You ready? First song you learned on the guitar. Lukey. What is that? Uh, would you like to hear it? Yes. It's a song from Newfoundland, and I've always loved the folk music of Newfoundland. Well, Lukey's boat is painted green, ha, me boys. Lukey's boat is painted green, the prettiest boat that you've ever seen, ha. Me boys are riddle I day. Aha, me boys are riddle I day. Now Lukey's boat's got a fine for cutty, ha, me boys. Lukey's boat's got a fine for cutty, and every seam is trick with putty, aha. Me boys are riddle I day. Aha, me boys are in light day. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Very rhythmic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what is your karaoke song? <laughs> Anything by Counting Crows. Nice. <laughs> Dogs or cats? Snakes. Love that. What is your I coffee order? Drip with a little bit of cream in. Were you about to say that you have a snake? Yes, her name is Severus. She's a boa. Oh. Favorite junk food? Ice cream. Favorite U.S. city? Gosh, that's so hard to answer. I, I can't answer. Okay. I, <laughs> pass. I have, there's too, yeah, pass. There's, there's too many that I love, and like part of, part of why I tour is because it means I don't really have to choose. First album you bought with your own money? Great Big C, Something Beautiful. What was your first concert? The Great Big C in Cleveland. <laughs> nice. I, I think that it's it's becoming pretty clear. <laughs> yeah. Who your number got, one what is. What got me in. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least, yeah. The last book you read. Axiom's End by Lindsay Ellis. Beatles or the Rolling Stones? The Grateful Dead. Wow. All right. Uh, flying or Invisibility? Flight. Star Trek or Star Wars? Oh... I am going to disappoint a lot of people who care about me. Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last one. Where is the most beautiful place you've ever visited? When I was 12, I got to go to the top of a mountain up in Montana, and it just absolutely took my breath away. Oh, that's a good end to the lightning round. Thank you so <laughs> much, Alex. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me.
Basic Folk This Week, produced by Laura McCarthy. Lindsay Myers is our business manager. Alex Stanton of the band Townspeople does our music. Basic Folk is on the American Songwriter Podcast Network. I'm Cindy Howes. Happy to be your host today on Basic Folk, which is what I do basically all the time. Uh, And if you liked this podcast, please share it with uh, your contra dance loving friends, um, your mom and your dad and your brothers and your sisters, all your college friends, all your camp friends, all your book club friends. They just don't know about it and they want to. Trust me. It would be also very helpful if you subscribed, rate, and reviewed Basic Folk on whatever platform you like using, like iTunes. You can also find all 87 episodes of the podcast at my website, cindyhouse.net. Thank you for listening, and I will talk to you later. Bye.